So what's in your toolbox? How many of you know today, and, and this is, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can. How many of you know today kind of the gift that God's, maybe one or two of the gifts that you know works in your life that God has given you? Praise God. Praise God. Because I'm going to tell you something. Once you find out what it is you're given to do and what you're gifted to do, everything becomes better and easier. Uh, I had uh, two men of God that spoke when we, when we planted the church. One was Pastor Whitfield. The, the other one I was listening to a, a, a CD by Brother Hagan. And both of them said the same thing when we planted the church. It was a confirmation to me. It says, find out what it is you're called to do and never let anyone talk you out of it. And I can honestly say after 17 years, I've never wrestled personally if I'm the pastor of this church. I've never looked for a plan B. I just knew God told me to come and do it. And I knew, as Sheila said, God doesn't repent. He doesn't regret that he called you. He doesn't regret that he gifted you. You may go long periods of time like I did without being in your gifting, without fulfilling the call of God on your life. But listen, God's not, he's not ticked off. He's not a man. He's not as a man. Good setup. We didn't plan it, but a great setup. And, and he doesn't repent that he gives you the gift. says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He never regretted. And so anyway, as we look at this again, the toolbox represents your heart. The gifts is what God gives you. And I just want you to get this visual so that you'll always remember. And you say, does it work that way? Yeah, the Lord reminded me this past week. I still remember one of the first messages I ever heard Pastor Whitfield minister at Agape Faith Church. And I didn't remember all of them, but I remembered that. And why? Because he had a rowboat up on the stage. I, I remembered the fishing ceremony, you know, or the, the message. You know what I'm saying? It was something that could connect the dots. So let's jump in, and as I said, the Holy Spirit, the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and let me just say this real quick. I grew up Pentecostal, and we were to the extreme over here. We blamed the Holy Spirit for everything. Even if we were out of order and causing confusion in the church, and we did... We blame the Holy Spirit. But on the same token, you had the other camp over here that rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He was like the weird cousin nobody wanted to talk about. And the problem with that is we left the power out of the church. The Holy Spirit is the power that causes the church to be. And so we're going to bring some balance to that in the next four weeks or ever how many weeks we go. Jesus said this in John 14, 15, and 16. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Now the word helper there in the Greek is parakletos, which means someone called alongside to help you. You see how important it is that we don't neglect the ministry of the Holy Spirit? We need him. He's your helper. The King James says he's your comforter. The word, the definition is he's our intercessor. He's our consoler. He's our advocate. He pleads your case. And he's your comforter. He's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with, with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. What, is an, what could, I'm not saying all orphans, let's just take in the physical, an orphan. What is some of the things an orphan can feel? Neglected? Don't belong? Subpar? Less than? I'm not saying anybody's ever been an orphan felt that way. I'm saying these are some things that an orphan could feel. What do you and I feel without the Holy Spirit? All the things I just said. See, I grew up in Pentecostal, and, and, I, and everything about the Holy Spirit was jumping pews and hollering and shouting and running around the room. And, I, and please, I'm not being critical of that. If the Spirit of God gets on you and you want to run around the room, you ain't going to scare me. 
I don't believe there's a person in here who can do anything, including Bibi, that would scare me. If the Spirit of God comes on you and you do so, you ain't going to scare me because I've seen some stuff. But my, my connecting the Holy Spirit with all of that, what I didn't know until I really gave my heart to the Lord in 1996, is I didn't know that he was called to be my helper. He was called to be my friend. In other words, when it's dark and nobody else is around and nobody seems to understand you and maybe people are criticizing you and maybe people don't get you, he does. And he's an ever-present help in your time of need. He's your comforter. You and I, when we receive and understand that when we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in our heart. When you get that revelation down in your heart, you, you should never feel alone again. I wish I could articulate it the way it feels to me, but it's really hard to do that. But you, you, if you experience that relationship, you understand it. You know, Bibi may go to the store and she's gone. So I'm alone. But I'm not alone. I'm never alone. You're never alone. You're not an orphan. You're a child of God. And in order for us to take our rightful place and let God into our heart, our toolbox, and receive the gifts he has for us, we have to realize we're a son or a daughter. So this whole message is going to not just talk to us about the importance of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to assure us who we are, and it's also going to assure us of what we have. Here's what Jesus said. He'd never leave them orphans. He said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 1 and 2 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as fire, one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Now there's two things I want to say right here, and we're not going to teach on the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit today unless God directs us a little later in the message. But understand this, when you're born again child of God, you're born again by the Spirit of God or you're not born again. You have accepted a social gospel, you've accepted something in, in your intellect, but when you're born again, your heart's renewed, recreated as the Bible says, it's because of the Holy Spirit, it's not because of anything else. But then there's an infilling, or if you will, a baptos, baptism into the Holy Spirit. And that's where you're so full, if I keep pouring water in that jug there, it's going to overflow. That's why they said, be filled with the Spirit. Paul said it this way, he said, don't be drunk with wine where it's in excess. He said, but be filled with the Spirit. What was he saying? The wine is a counterfeit, the Spirit's the real deal. And so, we'll talk about that maybe a little later. But I just want you to know there's two things with the Holy Spirit. You, but in order to be born again, it's because of the Spirit of God. Well, when they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, on the day of Pentecost, there were some cra very interesting things happening. Number one, and if you go back and read it, the men and women around thought they were drunk because they were filled with the Spirit. How many of you have ever seen anybody so filled with the Spirit they're drunk? Yeah. I'm looking at Chad. I remember he was in camp one time and it looked like he had turned up a, a filth of whiskey. We had to carry him and put him in bed. I, I've never been that way, but I've seen other people that way. And you say, well, that's not real. Well, you, <laughs> you better quit questioning other people's testimony. Yeah. Listen, he's God. I remember talking to a guy one day, we was at camp then, and all of a sudden he just started talking, he just fell out. He said, well that really happened? Yeah. Happened in Solomon when he dedicated the temple. They all fell out. The presence of the Lord was so strong. That was in the Old Testament, that's four acts. As the presence of God was so strong, they all fell out. And people said, well I don't believe that. Well, it don't matter if you believe it or not, it's still God. And I believe most of you do. I'm just saying it. That doesn't matter. One thing I've learned with the things of God, I never question another man or woman's testimony. Because that's their experience. 
Are you with me? So anyway, that was happening. They were saying they were drunk and they were all filled. But let me tell you what God was doing. And, and, and I just never have heard people preach this. How many of you know God wants the body of Christ to be unified? See, I told you something awesome is going to happen. Pretty awesome tool, toolbox, ain't it, guys? Robert had the right idea. He said, you ought to brought that in Father's Day and give it away. <laughs> Wasn't his toolbox. <laughs> but this is what God's got in mind for you. This is an OCD man's toolbox. Okay, it's, it's right, Chad? See, if you, you can't see it from back there, but this is fasteners, electrical, plumbing, construction, cordless tools, and then the handy-dandy. Yeah. And you say, how in the world do you... I know, what, I know where everything in is in here. You could ask me for something, I can tell you where to go look at it. Why am I telling you that? See, the gift inside of you, you ought to be able to pull it up just like that. You shouldn't be in a situation in Walmart and somebody needing your help and you think, okay, what's my gift? You should know your story well enough to turn to the right page and begin to share with them. Why? Because he said he'd give you the power to do that. Amen. So this was what was happening in, uh, on the day of Pentecost. Here's the one that you don't hear preached that I believe with all my heart took place. I can't prove it necessarily in Scripture, but you can't disprove it. So we'll just have to leave it at that. How many of you remember the Tower of Babel? What did God say? He said, if we don't go down there and confuse their language, nothing will be impossible with them. And people were sc scattered abroad. If you go back and read about the Tower of Babel and archaeological digs, what you find is the tower they was building, listen to me church, they were building it out of what they referred to as ziggurats. Not cigarettes, ziggurats. And what they were was like building blocks, if you would, but carved on these archaeological digs they done, carved in the blocks was astrology signs. What was that? Man elevating himself above God. And God says, that's enough. So he confused their language. But when you look in Acts 2, it said people were from all of these different regions that day. There was 120 in the upper room, but all the people in Jerusalem was all scattered around. It said when they began to speak in other tongues, every man heard in his own language. What did God do? He brought it all back together. And see, we shouldn't have to preach on unity in the church. I don't know if you've noticed this. You don't hear your pastor preach on unity. Why? Because we shouldn't have to. We're the body. What I do need to preach on is who you are in Christ, what you have, and how to use it. This is unity. If you hear these things, and I, this is another reason I wanted to do this, listen. That's not a good one. I mean, it's a good one, but it doesn't make the sound I want it to. I want you to listen. See, God wants us to lock together and do something amazing for him. He built this building to show us he can do it. Now it's time to do it. He wants us to affect this community. He wants us to affect our workplace. He wants us to affect our family. And he gave us a place to come together and learn how to do that. But they all began to hear in their own language. See, this is something that I received years ago. People say, well, I think we ought to do this. I think we ought to do this. What does God say? It was so <laughs> elementary when I heard this, but it really clicked with me years ago. There's only one Holy Spirit. I know that's deep. <laughs> so what does that mean? If you're in tune with the Holy Spirit and he's in tune with the Holy Spirit and I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't have to preach on unity. See, what I've come to conclude is this. That's the other man's opinion and that's okay. Everybody's got one. I'll hear somebody preaching and I'm like, well, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily go that direction. I, I, don't, I don't quite see it that way. But I, I, I'm strong enough in the Lord to say, you know what? Maybe we have a little, little bit there, but we agree on what this really is about. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Are y'all with me? 
But now I go away to him who has sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Why did sorrow fill their heart? Because they already began to feel like an orphan. They've been with him three and a half years. He's about to leave. And sorrow has already filled their heart. See, my desire is this. If I went home to be with the Lord today, none of you would be uh, lost without me because you'd still have Jesus. People that are lost without a leader, and I'm not saying it doesn't take a while to get your placement back, but see, our faith is in God. He just put me here to teach you, to lead this thing. I still say he's got a sense of humor, but anyway. One of my favorite passages, John 16, 7, says, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, think about this. They've been watching him raise the dead, heal the sick, cause the lame to walk, blind eyes open, 15,000 fed with a few fish on a hillside, and now Jesus has the audacity to tell them, Listen, guys, it's better if I go away. Yes, Lord. It'd be equivalent to t me telling you maybe something. This would be a good illustration. It'd be equivalent to me telling you today, well, you're better to stand, so get rid of the chair. What was Jesus doing? It was like he was removing himself from what they held dear. They began to feel like orphans. But he said this, the helper, for if I do not go away, the helper, parakletos, will not come to you but if I depart, I will send him. So he is not a man that he should lie. When he said, I'm going to go away, you go to Jerusalem, you wait. In the upper room, I'm going to send him. Now let me be clear about something. Because people used to teach this years ago and it's not accurate, it's not scriptural. They would say you have to tarry or wait on the Holy Spirit. No, that was the first bunch. You don't, that's the only time you find it in scripture is they had to wait on the Holy Spirit. Paul was preaching to Cornelius. His whole family was saved. They all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 19. Paul, having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, finding certain disciples, meaning they were already saved, finding certain disciples, asked them the question, said, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we hadn't so much hear, heard that they be a Holy Spirit. Paul, having laying his hands on them, they all received the Holy Spirit instantly. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. You don't have to wait on the Holy Spirit. Receive Him. Amen. John 8, 6, 8, 16, 8 and 9. And when he, he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Now I want you to focus on that word I underline, convict. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment... Now, before we go on, I'll read the next two verses together. Convict, when I was growing up in church, conviction was one of those things that when, when pastors would start breathing fire and start hollering conviction, people started checking out. It's where we get the term, you know, that guy's full of hell, he's preaching hell, fire, and brimstone. Now, we've went to the other ditch. Let me just say that, but I don't have time to teach on that. But there's a balance. And I believe here's the balance. Conviction is nothing more than God convincing you and I to change our mind. We taught that as very difficult stuff. But see, my friend, the Holy Spirit, he doesn't teach it that way. I can tell you. Without any reservations, some of the most major changes I've made in my life has been in a gentle whisper when he said, you need to change, boy. Some of you remember the story when me and B.B. got in a fight in front of my administrative assistant. I mean, we didn't hit each other. Uh, it looked like we were about to. This was at West End Street. We just blew up. You, don't look at me all holy. You've done it. <laughs> If you've been married any time you have, if you hadn't, you probably don't have no passion. And the next morning, 
I read 1 Corinthians just because it was part of my reading program. I wasn't looking for an answer, wasn't looking for anything. Didn't even know I was wrong at that point. Because I was still thinking she was wrong. And I read it from a, a different translation that morning. It says, love don't behave rude, does not behave rudely. And I apologized, right? Have I missed it since? No. <laughs> I hadn't in about two days, maybe, or, you know, something. But God didn't beat me up and take a stick to me. I still remember several months ago, and, and she can testify if it's any different than what I'm saying. She has a right to grab a mic and tell me, tell you. But I remember a few months ago when she said, you, 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 your vocation is communicating and you're the worst at it with us as I've seen. She wasn't being ugly. She was being truthful. Sometimes the people that you love the most, the people that's closest to you, are the hardest to communicate. Why? Because we take them for granted. Again, the conviction, it wasn't, it wasn't just what she said. I went and got in the, I went to the, the, the tool shed, the brick building where we keep our motorcycles. I was just sitting in there. And the Holy Spirit began to convict me. I began to weep. I'm like, God, I don't want to win the world and lose my family. I don't want to mess up my family while I'm trying to reach the world. That's ridiculous. He convinced me. It wasn't hard. It wasn't... No, it was like, I love you. I want the best for you. Now, grab a hold of this. Let's go somewhere. And I got better. I didn't get bitter. got better. Now, think about convincing, and here's what he said. Convince the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment of sin, because the, <clears throat> they do not believe in me. What's the sin? That you do not, what's the sin for every person before they accept Christ? It's not their, it's not their list of sins. It's the sin of rejecting him. That's the sin. He said the sin that so easily beset you. In other words, when we ask Jesus into our heart, he forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future. But we've got to be convinced we're a sinner before he, we can repent. If I didn't know I was a sinner in 1996, why would I be looking for a Savior? Here's what the Holy Spirit come to do. And convince us of righteousness. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment. Listen to this. Of judgment. This one is, is still a lot of pastors miss this one. A lot of preachers. It says because the ruler of this world is judged. Let me tell you something. Your enemy, Satan, has been, he has been judged, convicted, and doomed. All the body of Christ needs to do is enforce what's already been enacted. Here's the three things he convinces us of. Sin. The Holy Spirit will convince us we have sin so we can repent. I just said that. If we, if we didn't have any, if we didn't know that, we would just remain in our sin. This is what is so wrong with the humanistic, universalist, universalist theories today. What's a universalist? You'll recognize this real quick when I say it. God is love and everybody's okay. That is heresy, folks. And not just a little bit of heresy. Heresy to the max. Why? What does that say? It says you're not a sinner, you don't need a savior. Now, did Jesus come to forgive the world of their sin? Absolutely. But he gave us a will to accept it. If we believe in universalism, then we'd have to take every one of whomsoever, whosoever, out of the Bible. Why? Because we have a choice. So he convicted us so we could repent. Now here's the one that the church has really missed, and years ago I did too. Righteousness. 
How many of you have been convinced or convicted by the Holy Spirit that you are the righteousness of God? See, there's what the... Let me, let me tell you, now, now, listen to me. Look up at me just a minute. I want you to get this. The world needs to... Before I accepted Christ, before you accepted Christ, you need to be convinced you had sin so you could repent. Amen? Once you've accepted Christ, you need to be convinced that you are now the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What will, what will being convinced of righteousness do with you? Well, the first thing it'll do, and it'll do it quickly, is it'll take that orphan heart out and throw it away. Because you'll realize you're a son or a daughter. I'm the righteousness of God, not based on my behavior. I'm the righteousness of God based on what he done. Holiness is about my behavior. I still need to keep his commandments. I still need to live right, not to be saved, just because it'll go well with me. God has a prescription, and if we follow, it's just a lot better. But our righteousness comes from above. He took all, I call it the great exchange. He took all of my filthy sins, and he gave me his righteousness. Best deal I ever made, and I love a good deal. The best one I've ever made. Why? Because I didn't have nothing to offer, and I gained everything, and so did you. So he convinces us of a righteousness. Here's the one that we need to get. Judgment. Have you ever been convinced Satan has been judged and that you have authority over him? See, I'm not trying to whoop the devil. He's already whipped. Quit rebuking the devil and live your life. Quit ever, every time you run in and stump your toe, don't blame the devil. It may just be you missed, a, you missed a spot and stumped your toe. Quit giving him so much credit. He's whipped. He's been beaten. How do I know that? Because Jesus hung on a cross over 2,000 years ago, stretched out between heaven and earth, and he said, it is finished. I've been to hell. I got, this is Jesus. He said, I've been to hell. I got keys to death, hell, and the grave. He said, all power's been given to me. Therefore, you go. What is, it, what is that? That's, that's the clarion call. It's called the Great Commission, not the Great Omission. It's the Great Commission. We are to go and be a witness. He never said do witnessing. He said be. What you be is much more important than what you do. How do you be a witness? You just be real. You just be real. Don't, don't preach at people. Be real with people. Live a life that in, in, inspires people to do better. To live for Christ. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. And bring to, rem bring to your remembrance all things that I said. In other words, this is so cool. I remember when I got this revelation. I was so excited. I was like a kid in a candy store. store. I'd read the Bible and I read that in John and I was like, wow. That means if I've ever read it, the Holy Spirit is obligated himself. I didn't. He did. He's obligated himself. If I need that scripture or anything else, he'll bring it back to my remembrance. See, to bring back to your remembrance means you knew it at one time. Memory is something you've already experienced. Don't be asking God to teach you the word and not open the pages. But when you open the pages or you dig a scripture, I don't care if it's just one. Ask God to just plant that down in your heart and when you need it, he'll bring it back. He said, I'll bring all things to your remembrance. Isn't that cool? God loves us so much. Can't forget anything. And don't be confessing that. I can't remember nothing. Yes, you can. He gives you spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Change your confession. And that's not a, that's not a condemnation. That's, I, please, don't. It's a, I'm just trying to convince you of the truth. He said he'd bring all things to remembrance. Quit denying it. I believe I can remember. 
I believe I can remember your name. I believe I can, there's certain things that especially I want to remember. I believe I can remember where to find the verse when I need it. And so can you. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak, and he will tell you things to come. <sighs> wow. How many of you, God told you things to come? Yeah. What's the psychic? What's the psychic? <laughs> it's, it's a counterfeit. It's just a counterfeit, mocking what God has already told us you could have. Now, he didn't tell you, he didn't say, I'll tell you all things to come. He said, I'll tell you things to come, tell you things to come. I was, I got, you ever talking to the Lord and get tickled because you knew you stuck your foot in your mouth? I was out here the other day walking the trails. And if y'all don't know it, we got a walking trail. It's got scriptures on it. It starts right over here and walks all the way around the property. I was walking, meditating, reading the scriptures. And uh, I was coming back up this side here. And I was just walking up through there and I'm talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I said, uh, show me what you see. And then I got tickled. <laughs> I thought, boy, I'm glad you didn't answer that prayer. Can you imagine what it'd be like if you seen what God's seen? Well, number one, I wouldn't have a head today. It blew off. So I rephrased my prayer. I said, Lord, show me what you see for us now. I can't handle too far out there. But see, he wants to do that. He wants to tell you things to come. I remember I was in a, in a conference in Tennessee. And some of the, Bill Johnson and some of the, uh, the guys with a very prophetic voice was there. R.T. Kendall, uh, Larry Randolph, is just some powerful generals in God's army. And, and some of these guys, Larry Randolph in particular, he had called somebody up from about the third row, kind of across from where I was sitting, and he called this lady and her mother up. He'd never met them, and he called them up by name. It freaked me out. I mean, I've seen some prophecy before, but that one freaked me out first time I'd ever seen it. And then it was somebody over here. And I was questioning God, just like you are right now. It's okay. It's okay. Me and Malachi was in Taco Bell in Yakinville, North Carolina. Just a couple days after. And I, anybody that knows me knows I'm really good at remembering names and faces. And this young couple walked by us with a child in a stroller. And as soon as their wind, if you will, swished by me, God gave me both of them's name. I didn't do anything with it. Didn't know what to do. And I don't think I was supposed to do anything. I think all it was was the Holy Spirit said, quit questioning my ability. I created everything you see, everything you don't see. Why would you ever, why would you ever be able to comprehend I can't do whatever I need to do? And it changed the way I seen things. He's God. The Holy Spirit stepped out on the water and created everything you see by God's voice. So it says here he's your tour guide. I want to show you this pit. Well, let me just put the picture up. How many of you have ever been to the Biltmore house? Wow, a lot of you. Uh, probably, B.B., you help me here if, I, if I, you probably know. But probably about 30 years ago, I went to this house before me and B.B. was married. I, I was still married to Chad's mom. And me and Lisa went to that house. And we went through it. And I was very impressed with the house. I mean, that's a big house. I don't know if it still is, but it's the largest personal home. At one time, it was the largest personal home in America. And so I was very impressed with it. But that was about it. Me and B.B. went probably about, what, 15 years ago? Something like that. Um, and, um, but we done something different. When we got up there to pay, they offered to sell us a tour guide on MP3 player for seven bucks. And they were going to guide us through the mansion, the house. I'm not going to tell you everything I learned because we don't have time. 
But I just want to hit you with a few things that 30 years ago I didn't know, 15 years ago I knew clearly. Why? Because I had a tour guide. The Holy Spirit said, I'll guide you into all truths. One thing I didn't know is in this beautiful lawn was a railroad that had to come in to supply the supplies to build the house. I didn't know that a bachelor <laughs> built the house. That's enough house for 15, 20 kids or 50 maybe. He was a single guy, George Vanderbilt. I didn't know that his dad had made two fortunes, one with the railroad and one with the ship industry. I didn't know that they've never disclosed what it costs to build this burger. I didn't know that they had electricity when nobody else did. I didn't know that inside this house, well, I seen the pool the first time, but I didn't realize it was heated and lighted. And we're talking about in the beginning of 1900. I didn't know that the servants that took care of this house 30 years ago, I knew 15 years ago when we went to see it, that the servants were so freaked out by indoor plumbing they wouldn't drink the water because they didn't know if the pipes run together with the sewer. What am I telling you? Real simple. I'm not going to belabor this at all. What am I telling you? You can accept Jesus and not rely on the Holy Spirit and you will get to heaven. But I'm going to tell you something. If you'll let him be your tour guide, the journey, the adventure you're going to take is going to be far above anything you could ever hope, ask, or think. Why? Because he wants to lead and guide you into all truth. Not some of it. All of it. He will expand your vision. He'll make you see things you've never seen if you will invite him in. Don't treat him like somebody over here. Realize he lives inside of you and depend on him every day and he'll show you some cool stuff. He won't tell you everything, but he'll tell you the next thing. The Holy Spirit is very much like a riverboat pilot. How many of you remember Huck Finn? Yeah. What's a riverboat pilot? He's not the captain. He's the guy that tells the captain how to stir the ship. The Holy Spirit don't stir the ship for you, but he'll whisper in your heart, in your head how to stir it. Just like this building you're sitting in. He didn't build the building. He said if I'd take the steps and everybody get involved, he'd show us how to do it. And he did. And he'd give us the tools to do it. Next week we're going to talk about some of the tools in here. And, 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 and just let me just give you this illustration real quick and then we'll hit it again next week. There's a ton of tools in here. And believe it or not, even though they're clean, I am OCD, all of these tools are used. They'll leave here today. Why? Because i got to use them this week on some stuff. And I know what all that stuff is in there. And there's all kinds of neat gadgets in there. Oscillating saws and sawzalls and drills and impact drivers and clamps and drop cords and all that stuff. But do you know I could take this set of tools with me? But if I leave this right here, I'm in a mess. So this here kind of represents, this, this part right here kind of represents prayer, communion with God. See, if you don't have communion with God and prayer with God, none of the other stuff really works. But he's your riverboat pilot. He wants to speak things to you. But as I'm not going to unpack this, I'm just going to go through it. We'll pick it up next week here. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared, has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches th all things, yes, the deep things of God. You have not yet seen it, but I'm believing that you will. How many of you are really needing God to speak to you about the next move in your life? The next, the next thing. Listen, you don't you miss a service. If you miss it physically, get the, get the recording. Why? God's going to unpack some stuff. No pun, this tool set, if you'll notice, says pack out. But we're going to unpack. We're going to unpack scriptures that will cause you things that God has showed me over the years for many years now. Twenty some years. And I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to reveal it all to me again. Why? Because I know it has the power to change your life. It changed mine in a dramatic way. And it showed me things I'd never seen. I've heard things I'd never heard. 
And it changed my life. And that's what I believe God wants to do with all of us. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth about who we are and what we have. He is our wonderful tour guide.